brainchild of now the world's biggest video game company, and with it, they redefined an entire industry. For a period of time there, Nintendo was a word used to describe video games in general. It was the Christmas gift every kid wanted. There was just a little magical quality to Nintendo that caught on with the public. And it took over toy stores around the world. When I went to Toys R Us, it was an aisle, two aisles long. This side was all Nintendo, this side was all Nintendo. And you went down there and it was like... The Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES, gave kids a new way to play games and challenged them with every title. With the NES, a lot of the titles, you played to the end. And you didn't just play for three or four days. You played for weeks, sometimes months. And although the NES wasn't the only game in town... The NES essentially received the baton from the arcade era and ran with it. They did it with characters that became pop culture icons. You know, so when you see a Mario, like people are dressed up as Mario for Halloween, you just see it in so many different places, um, and everybody instantly knows what that is. And games that were dubbed immediate classics. Every game they came out with really had a level of success to one degree or another. I can't say that about everybody. I can certainly say it about Nintendo. But this video game console didn't fade when it left store shelves. It's still around with a fan base of millions across the world and continues to impact a lot of people like this modern day treasure hunter from london ontario canada who loves nintendo so much that he started a quest to get all 678 original nes games in person within 30 days nintendo's such a part of him that he's willing to crisscross the country in search of these holy grail like artifacts a journey like that with someone pursuing their dream is bound to change anyone and become the stuff of legend it's what he's calling his nintendo quest So let me tell you a little secret. That guy hunting those games, that's Jay. And we've been friends for a really long time. And he's always dreamt of owning a complete NES collection. So I dared him to do it and only gave him 30 days and told him he couldn't use the internet in any way. Cause as a collector, that's really cool to me. But as a filmmaker, that's the kind of thing I want to see captured because following Jay around, we'll get to talk to other members of our community the competitive gamers and personalities, and the other diehard collectors. And all of those people will get a chance to weigh in on what makes the NES so resilient and amazingly popular 30 years later. I mean, no piece of technology lasts 30 years. We never use phones, cars, or computers that long. So what makes the NES the exception to the rule? Well, we're gonna find out. But first, let's learn a little bit more about Jay. Because clearly, he's a fan. Jay's been my best friend for more than 30 years. He's got a great dog named Spencer, a hell of a Star Wars collection. Huge fan of Star Wars. This set here is my favorite. These were kind of throwbacks to the original packaging. And an impressive library of games. So this is uh, pretty much most of my collection here. Mighty Final Fight. Really, really personal favorite of mine here, Stack Up. I don't know if it's my favorite NES game, but it's pretty close. Bloom Fight. There are precisely three things he's passionate about. Star Wars, rock and roll, and video games. If I remember correctly, he always lined his haircut up to be what Dave Grohl was wearing at the time. He's just your friend, just to be your friend, and does not matter what you do or what you say. Jay's the perfect guy to take on this adventure because as a manager of a video game store, he has years of retail experience that will help him out in the wild. Not to mention, he's been collecting every kind of video game merchandise for over 30 years. Yeah, you called me on my phone, and you're like, okay, I dare you, I dare you. We'll go out and I dare you to get every single Nintendo game. And you're like, how about this? How about we do it in a month? We'll do it in 30 days. I, I'm like, well, Rob, that's cool, but I could just go on eBay, you know, and I could buy someone's private collection, probably get 300 of the games out of the way in one click. You're like, let's do it old school, man. Let's go and we'll hit the street. And I'm like, that's a really good idea. So here's what Jay's up against. 
He's got 30 days to get all 678 officially North American released Nintendo games. Thankfully, that does not include contest carts like Nintendo World Championships, but it does include stadium events and Little Samson. And he's got to pay for every single game himself, with no help from friends or the film production. Did we mention he can't use the internet to aid him in any capacity? And he's got to start from scratch, regardless of what's in his current collection. One more thing, Jay's loaded a special app on his tablet, and it's really cool because it ranks all the games by rarity, but more importantly, it sorts all his purchases too. So of the 678 games, he knows which ones he has, but he also knows which ones he has to find. We don't know exactly where we're going. We don't know exactly when we're gonna get there. We don't know exactly who we're gonna talk to or what we're gonna find. There's the thinnest of plans out there, and no doubt there's gonna be a 100 challenges along the way. And I'm sure it's going to have a transformative effect on, on Jay. Oh, he'll be a different person. First off, that he's venturing away. Like he's a real homebody. Some way, somehow, he'll succeed at what he wants to do with this. I really wanted to stress on Jay the sense of history that he and I had with each other, but also our combined history with the NES. And there was one place that really summed this up and shows how seriously we took and still take that game system. This, of course, is my treehouse, wow. but, but for a very brief period, it was something else. This was the original NES club. Or clubhouse. Clubhouse, there yeah. you go. Look but how we small had, it is. We had our first Nintendo club in here. Yeah. Let's take a trip down memory lane. Of course you want to see us up here. Yeah. Oh. Stunt work, right? Here we go. Oh, right. getting old. All right, Arjun and charge. All right, Winnie the Pooh, you're in? Good. All right, so... Uh, <laughs> what were we thinking? <laughs> Where are we going to put a TV in this well, place now? Well, on the corner, obviously. I, hope, I really hope this doesn't collapse, because that would really suck. This journey is going to be incredible. I'm going to literally go across the country. I'm going to get to see all these amazing game stores, all these different types of people. Regardless of whether he gets all the games, it's just gonna be this massive game loving. It's just gonna be fun. I think the collecting of the games, I think will be the easier part for him. I think that he'll be right into it. I think he'll be focused. Again, I'll say it, man. Life is too short to be doing something that you don't wanna do every day. There's no cheat codes, there's no game genie, there's no extra lives, there's none of that stuff. He's got 30 days to figure this game out and beat it and that's it. And the big boss at the end of the game is the ticking clock. If he doesn't beat that, he loses a chance at a dream. Well, Jay gets ready for the biggest challenge of his entire life. Let's take a look back at the NES and the company that introduced it. Because after all, Nintendo managed to revolutionize the entire industry and change the world. So here's Nintendo History 101, the abridged two-minute version. Nintendo History 101, the two-minute version. Nintendo may be a global company today, but this wasn't always the case. They started in Japan in 1889, making Hanafuda cards, something like the playing cards we use today. This was their staple, and they did it well enough that by the 1950s, Disney offered them a licensing deal. This was a major turning point, because with the Disney license, Nintendo firsthand saw the power of the family-centric demographic. So, with their increasing profits, they tried making a toy, the Ultra Hand, and that too was a huge success. By the 1970s, electronic toys were the big trend, and Nintendo cashed in on light zapper technology with electronic shooting galleries. When the coin-operated arcade era hit, Nintendo conquered that market too, with game cabinets like Radar Scope and Donkey Kong. And of course, video game consoles for the home was the next big wave, and Nintendo's Famicom, a name that bridges family and computer, was launched in Japan in 1983. Hefty price tag, you say? Ha ha ha, says Nintendo, as the Famicom sweeps 90% of Japan's market with revolutionary controllers, appealing characters, and innovative gameplay. Soon after, though, the video game industry crashed and threatened to thwart Nintendo's Famicom plan for a North American launch. Because video games were so uncool in North America, Nintendo had to redesign their console and fool retailers into carrying it. So they made it look completely different, much more like a VCR, and packaged it with a robot and a light zapper to give it a toy-like feel. Despite the naysayers, the Famicom, which was renamed the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES for short, launched to massive success without ever using the words video, game, or console to sell it. 
This has been Nintendo History 101. What's all this mean? Well, at a glance, Nintendo's focus on family-friendly games and universally appealing themes is timeless. Regardless of trends or technological breakthroughs, the Nintendo experience is always challenging and fun for everyone. do this so we're gonna go see Murray and Shannon right now it's the first stop <laughs> holy moly what's up guys Mario and Luigi how are you what's up buddy how are you how are you man Shannon how are you love you good to see ya huge this is their toy and, and you can show me. You can tell me about each game if you want to do that. They, they don't know these ones. Well, these then, are the ones we haven't let them the, see. Then Little Murr can tell me about them. So we got Swords, Swords and, and Serpents. Serpents. I've never actually ever seen this one, so that's no. pretty cool. No? Good start. All right, so this is special because these are my favorite, the black box ones, right? Number one is golf, so that's the record. Seeing Murray and Shannon's kids dressed up as Mario and Luigi was the perfect start to this Nintendo challenge but it also helped that Jay managed to get a stack of games for next to nothing. The biggest score out of that was this. Oh, What's Kirby. that? Kirby. Definitely. Why is that, why is that rare? Uh, this is why one is of, that the biggest score? Well, it's a licensed, or not a licensed, it's a first party Nintendo game, which are always expensive. Again, it's not necessarily one of the rarest, but it's one I'm glad that I'm knocking off the list. Yo, yo. I mean, what's going on? What's up? We got a call earlier in the day from Skyler, who said he only had a few carts or NES cartridges left to offer Jay due to a trade he made with another friend of ours. Still, every game is a necessity, and Jay couldn't afford to pass anything up. You know, I'll throw that one in, and we'll go say five bucks a game, twenty bucks. No, no. <laughs> no, I was thinking more like. Less than a dollar each. A less than a dollar each? <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe like 10? What are they selling for? They're selling for like five bucks. I got dodgeball here, man. Remember that game? I'll give you 10 bucks for this. 10 bucks? That's fine. Se separated at birth. What? Are we? I don't think so. Everyone used to say we were brothers in high school. I'm the one who got the less chromosome. Though. What? Oh! <laughs> well, I told you Where I had the all the. Did you get this? Oh, well, I told you I had all the contracts. The what were we just talking about the card? Okay, hey, get look at my hand. I think that there is embedded into this a personal challenge to expand your horizons, expand your perspective on things. I hope that it equips Jay with some extra tools for just getting out there, being accessible just having the motivation to achieve some of your dreams. I've never even seen those. I've never even seen them. So there you go. I don't know, it's, how can you top that? Just one more shot of that beauty. Any as super fans can name dozens of great games and go on and on about what makes each of them special. I mean, you can't say that about every console library out there. Even people that have never played a game can probably name one or two or at least recognize characters from NES franchises like Mario or Zelda. But how has that happened? What has allowed them to transcend into pop culture icon status? What makes them stand the test of time? Well, one person that might know is a well-respected game designer, James Portnow. You see some of the best examples of game design in the 2D games that you have on the Nintendo. And I don't think that that, I think that play is timeless and it doesn't matter about the graphics. In the NES era, there was no shame. There was no embarrassment about the, like think about Mario, right? Mario is a crazy thing. Here's a plumber dude with a mustache jumping on turtles and mushrooms. Um, that would never get greenlit. If that was a new title today, if that you pitched that in some office, you would never get that greenlit today. That era of games relied on imagination, right? They couldn't put everything in. Um, they couldn't make it photorealistic. And so in a lot of ways, uh, they gave you the bones of the narrative, right? But let you live that experience through play. And 
tell yourself your own story through how you experience that game. And to me, that was a powerful thing. And so we tried to shy away from all the zany, uninhibitedly joyous things that we did in this era. And I think there's a desire to see that again, too. Well, I didn't get much sleep. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it feels like 30 day Christmas Eve, 30 Christmas Eves in a row. <laughs> That's right. Um, I'm excited. I can't wait to see Sid. Yeah, you're good. Just poop. Stop. Sid Bolton is Canada's top video game collector with over 15,000 games in his collection, only 90 minutes away in Brantford, Ontario. He's the curator of the Personal Computer Museum and has written a great book on collecting all things Dragon's Lair. I played on an old Atari 2600 but there was something about Super Mario Brothers and how the quality was so good, the gameplay was great, the music was wonderful, that really for me it was video game magic. Whether you loved it or hated it, the licensing deal that Nintendo set forward really, really set you know, the tone for the industry going forward and it made a huge difference in the quality of the games that we got to play at home. I normally never ever ever sell stuff out of my own collection ever for any reason like people have asked i've you know just recently someone is a real pokemon fan and he was asking me about buying you know one of my pokemon games and i'm like no i, I don't sell any of my stuff but i mean i suppose i have the i mean you have limited options as to what you can do right i don't i can i could probably find another one somewhere sometime come on sid let's make a deal all right yeah. all right thanks man great cool you need to go to the bank. I do, I need to go to the <laughs> bank, yeah. He's gonna have to look for some of these titles under every nook and cranny around. It's gonna be tough, but a lot of fun. Sid, amazing guy, and he never, ever, ever sells out of the private collection. So I feel quite honored. Not only that that was a game that I've wanted since forever, but that it's from Sid's private collection. Like that's, that's amazing. Jay now switches his focus to the retail shops. Emotions are high and anxiety starts to set in as Jay needs to haggle as much as possible. This is something he hates and has limited experience doing. What are we looking at, man, for Nintendo stuff? I can't remember. These are more of the cobbles here. Yeah. Okay, I have other games for showcases, some back here. Yeah. So, you're a title you're after. Oh, I gotta get them all, so I'm looking to get the best price in bulk that I can. So what, what do you, what do we, you usually have like a sign here, I can't remember. Um, like six for 20 or something like that? Uh, we're doing uh, five for 20 right now. Five for 20. Yeah. That's way too much money. That's way too much money. There's no, okay. I'm not paying that for those, there's no well, way. Well, there's sticker price and then there's the cash price. Yeah, I know, so we'll talk about that. I just want to get an idea right now of what we're looking at. That was almost the best deal we got. Negotiation-wise, how do you think that went? It, good. You, you helped me there, so, so it was nice, but you didn't do it for me. Right. So I think it's just gonna get better. That was my first store, right? So I mean, yeah. I'm glad, uh, glad we did it. Where do you see this stuff? Where do we record this stuff that we got in there? Okay, now this is a store that I've had pegged. I know what he's got, I know what his prices are, and then I find this. Okay. Up until yesterday. I've never seen it, oh. and I've never seen that before. Again, this. I think tomorrow is gonna be another great day quantity-wise. One of the most memorable and haunting elements of the NES experience is the music. It's yet another detail that Nintendo did better than anyone else. The music, like a soundtrack to a movie, helps us define the experience and gives each game a unique quality, even helping to create an emotional bond with its players. When you had only three channels of audio plus a fourth channel for a white noise, think about that. Think about Mario and Zelda and only being limited to that space. So everything had to be so melodic. I'd say the music of the NES era was a lot, it seems like it was a lot more fun. Probably like the best music, hands down, on that system, the Dr. Mario stuff. Oh, do, 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 do. <laughs> I just love it. Any of the Konami games, they really put a lot of effort into their music. If you want to talk about the iconic of the iconic, 
take anything from Zelda. Legend of Zelda is like dun 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 this music in these games. They were very talented composers. They made songs that go in a big circle. So it goes through a few parts and you might not even notice that it's repeating. The Mario Brothers, of course, everybody knows that one. How's that go? Like that. Dun, 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 It's that melody, it's that hook. All stuff that we know the most is things that you can easily hum, that stick in your mind. It's the melody that's the most important thing. People will be humming Mario in hundreds of years from now. You know, it's that iconic. I've found a bunch of places that have a lot of common games for really, really, really reasonable prices. So now I'm focusing on getting the rare ones for decent prices. Once I get those out of the way, I'm gonna start worrying about buying the bulk stuff. With 678 titles in the NES library, the games have wildly different prices. Some cartridges cost a buck, tons can be had for under 20, but a few can fetch hundreds or thousands of dollars. Now the cost element aside, Jay's real challenge is simply gonna be tracking down some of these games. So he's keeping a close eye on 20 of the rarest ones, because in the end, if he can't find them, then he can't buy them. And at the top of Jay's list is a game called Stadium Events. This game goes for thousands of dollars, but other top 20 titles of note are Little Samson, Bonk's Adventure, Panic Restaurant, and Stack Up. And here are the games Jay's already secured. Now over 200 games under his belt, Jay's forced to go outside his hometown of London, Ontario. So we're gonna head to Toronto, two hours away, and visit the legendary ANC Games, which got its start as a convenience store until the brothers that operate it made it a paradise for retro gamers everywhere. Wow, now this is really impressive. We have the biggest selection, and we pride ourselves on great customer service. We're just a couple of guys that grew up with Nintendo and playing games, and we're living our dream. And we're here to always be able to have fun with our customers. They, they have one more in there that I've never seen, and they're kind of upselling me a little bit too because they've never seen it, and that's Bubble Bubble 2. Um, so far, it's by far the highest price or the highest ticketed game I've seen. So I'm really kind of struggling with that. I want to buy it from you guys. I know you've already given me really great deals here. Yeah. I'm going to take a chance and try and negotiate with you guys. Uh, you can tell me if it's way too low or what you think. Okay. And hopefully we'll meet in the middle somewhere. <laughs> it's for the cause, brothers. Okay, we're going right. to help your budget. For the cause. I got it at an exceptional price, and I'm not going to tell you what I paid for it, but I didn't pay sticker price. Those guys are absolutely incredible in there. Um, willing to help out, willing to negotiate. So far, by far the best store we've been to. I'm nervous, uh, I'll tell you that, and I think you know I'm pretty nervous. Um, no more comfort zone. It's gonna be heading into the States, uncharted territory, and uh, I just hope all the people we meet along the way are you know, half as nice as everything so far. I think everyone likes the idea of working in a game store just because if it's your hobby, it's a job where you're surrounded by your hobby and it's it's really interesting. You got nothing else, eh? Nothing in the back, no hidden gems. Unfortunately, no. No stadium events. <laughs> the, fir the first store, the guy was great. Willing to work with me, knew my quest, knew what I needed to get out of there. Uh, looking at the wacky races, 
couple of the more common ones you have here. The wacky races right there. The rest of the people honestly were a bunch of dicks. Um, the one guy even had to call the owner of the shop and the high price games I wanted, they weren't willing to budge a cent. And their big excuse was because you know, they don't make them anymore. <laughs> no. If he's not coming down on the prices, I'm not doing it. That's what I'm saying, get these at least thrown in. Just hundreds too much though okay. for that, so. No. Nope. No? Okay, fair enough, man. Put these back, we're good. Okay. There, there was definitely some tension when he's like, no, we're not budging. And then you didn't even ask on some games. It, it turns me off. As soon as, if they're not gonna work with me, I'm not gonna work with them. I'm not gonna give those people my business because the game I wanted was a nine out of 12. It's not that rare and we're gonna find it again. It's not like a stadium events. If that's the case, that's a different story. My gut says that you might have to change that tactic at some point. Well, I guess we'll see going on. All right, my friend, I think I've got a few. Um, I kind of just want to see where you're at okay. for pricing. Um, that will definitely determine what I'm doing with more of the common stuff. You know, these here, we could probably do 10 a piece on them and probably like buck a piece on these. So what are we looking at then for like common stuff? Is that the kind of price we're looking at? Or? Yeah, we could do common for you, probably like a buck and a half buck for most of them. Sports titles probably give you for 50 cents, you know? Okay, so that definitely changes everything. It's a much better deal than we've had so far. Okay. Thanks, dude, yep. appreciate it. So, does that change so now we're really gonna have to move if time's a factor, because there's a ton here. This is by far the best deal we've got so far. I'd be an absolute fool not to take it. So, yeah, so we got 78, 78. 78 off the so list. So that brings yeah. us over 300 now. Yep. Yeah. In five days. It's very good. Uh, you know what? It's it's 12.42 on day six. Day six. Turning into day seven. And here we are in Pittsburgh talking to a couple people and then we have an opportunity to talk about acquiring stadium events. Something worth addressing. We're gonna call. We're gonna call Josh Jones, um, who has a copy for sale, and he also messaged us, and he says he has a lot of other NES games for sale that we probably don't have. So Let, let's call him up, throw it on speakerphone, so we can hear what he says. Maybe get his story of how he got stadium events. Let's do that. Hi, is Josh there, please? Yeah, I him. Hey, Josh. It's Jay from the NES Club. How are you, man? What's up, dude? I'm good. Um, so we have a mutual friend and Todd Rogers there and he says you have a few games you're looking to uh, sell. One of them might be stadium events. Yeah. So stadium events was produced by Bandai. Uh, it was a track and field type game that used the power pad, Bandai's own power pad. Uh, got released very briefly. Uh, Nintendo said nope. We basically want uh, that game as our own. Rebranded it World Class Track Meet and bundled it with the power pad. So stadium events is ra very rare because there wasn't many produced and there wasn't many that got actually shipped out. As you can see, I brought a eBay auction up here. This one is the NTSC Minton box for $77,000, which is uh, pretty expensive if you ask me, but uh, <laughs> this is an extreme example, but this gives you the idea the rarity and the crazy eBay prices and the thing is, there have been lots like this sold on eBay. Um, it's really nice. There's no tears. There's no cracks. Now this it's is original. this is just the cart, right? The NTSC cart. Yeah. There's no there's no book. There's no box, obviously, with it. Yeah, I, I trust me. I wish I had all that. But right. No. So let me let me get this straight. One hundred percent. Let me hear. What what you're gonna sell it to me for? One hundred percent would not go lower than four thousand fifty dollars. What about um? What about thirty five? <laughs> Come on, man. L listen, you you gotta take. If I would have got it for the fifty bucks, I'd let you have it for two thousand. All right. Um. 
Hey, think about it. I mean, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely have to think about it. Um, just got off the phone with Josh Jones, uh, who's in Florida. Who's a really good friend with Todd Rogers. He has stadium events. <sighs> Here's the kicker. He wants quite a bit for it, a tad more than what it's worth. Okay, let's think about it this way. You get stadium events. Something goes wrong, you don't, maybe let's say you don't get a little Samson by the end of 30 days. Are you still satisfied? Well, that's not everything. And that's what the challenge was. But it's always come but down to, and it's always been me saying those two. Everybody's looking at stadium events. I think they're looking more at that than the completion. Everybody's talking about stadium events. I'm in a spot right now where there's no negotiations. That's and, just it. And I can't blame the guy because I wouldn't either. This is like the game of all video games to get within reason. You know what I mean? Like this is one of the holy grails. So So do you get it while you still have funds left over and you negotiate the remaining games? Or do you get it when you're against the wall and it's the only game left and you might not have the money? What's your heart telling you right now? To do it. Hey, Josh, what's up, man? How much? Um, so I think we're going to get Todd coming down the 29th, uh, the 31st of August. Um, are you okay to give him the cart then? First, uh, yeah, I'll, probably, I'll see him before the IRC. Let's see here. I'm going to have to try to meet up somewhere because... Um, well, yeah, he's coming the 31st, so, I, yeah, I would need him to bring the cart with him, and if that's the case, then you have a deal. You said $4,050. Yeah, that's exactly, I'm not going to make one penny off you. Thanks, Josh. Talk to you soon, brother. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, man. You oh. guys be safe. Yep, bye-bye. How's it feel to, uh... What are you thinking? Oh, I don't know, man. I'm like, my voice is gone. Um, you going to be able to sleep tonight? Get a second win from that? Yeah, I probably won't sleep tonight. That was, uh, I wasn't expecting that tonight. I mean, from the beginning of this journey, we thought we had everything mapped out, and this is how it would go, and everything has just been completely different than what we've seen. It's done. Still got again. Okay, so Little Samson is number one. Bonk's Adventure is number two. Panic Restaurant is number three. All right. Jetsons is in the top five for sure. I think I'm gonna be able to work with Darren. He seems pretty reasonable. And, and I'll just say this for the record. He only had one that was above. Everything else is far below what it's worth in that app. Right. So already, I'm ahead. The decent price games weren't the whole story though. Darren, the owner of Warp Zone, also made it known to us that a rival collector had been waiting for his large shipment of NES titles, and that he had been planning to scoop up the best games before Jay could arrive, and it seems he succeeded. Moreover, this rival Lex Luthor-like game collector was still there, and he had been lurking in the background watching our every single move during Jay's hunt. One of the, the five we were talking about earlier was there. Uh, there was a copy of the Jetsons. And unfortunately, we were there a little bit too late. Uh, one of the regulars there scooped it up at about uh, 9 or 10 a.m. this morning. We were there about two hours later. Jetsons was a game I've been looking for since I was maybe 9 or 10. I mean, I've been collecting since I was little. And seeing that and knowing that you guys are going to have a lot of opportunities to find games like this, I figured, OK, it's, it's no skin off of your guys' back in theory. What was great is that we did talk to him, because he was in there when we were filming. And he said, you know what, if you guys really, really, really want it, we'll cancel the transaction, and I'll give it to you for what I paid for it. Now, I'm a collector, obviously, and, and this guy was a fellow collector. 
And I just wouldn't feel right doing that. Why? He's got the rest of his life to get it. You've got 30 days. Yeah, Respect. but it's... He knew you were coming in. Yeah. And he knew what you were yeah. going to do. And he still scooped it up. That's not my personality, man. But we talk about collector etiquette, right? Yeah. I have it. I wanted to jump on an opportunity as soon as I saw it. I think karma in any form it is there. I mean, collecting karma, that's a good terminology. I've never heard it before, so... To be honest, you guys got games I wanted. So you guys are the villains. You know, collectors are collectors. They're gonna do what they gotta do to get their collection complete, too, just like I'm doing what I have to do. I mean, I've been doing this my, my entire life, so there, I don't think it's different, in other words, with what I've done over the past 22 years. Think ahead, come on. This whole Jetson saga with JD was leaving a bad taste in my mouth, but that didn't keep Jay down. Jay had a plan, and while it was a long shot, it might just nab him Jetsons by the end of the day. So the Jetson saga continues. Yep. We should have been in Cincinnati, possibly even on our way to Indianapolis, but here we are still in Columbus. What happened? What happened was pretty straightforward. We had a few shops we still wanted to hit, and instead of Jay just worrying about the games that he needed, we also found out about a couple of games left on JD's game list, and we just happened to find one. And we were looking for games for me and my quest, and we came upon that little guy right there, Snow Brothers. Now, I've already collected this pretty early in the journey. Rob thought it would be a great idea to pick it up so we can use it for trading, and guess what? It's about to pay off. The saga is almost complete. Jetsons has returned to the table. Out in the wild today, we found a Capcom classic, Snow Brothers, uh, and we used it for trade with JD here to get the Jetsons back and a couple of titles for Rob as well. So with that, okay. to you for these three titles. JD was sad to see Jetsons go so soon, but he knows he got a great game in Snow Brothers. On a side note, he asked us to make him as villainous as possible in the film. But even what we've shown you doesn't do his evil deeds and dastardly schemes justice. If you're a collector, you better watch your back for a guy named JD Lowe. He's pure evil. Yeah, I got a phone message from a number I know well, and uh, listened to the message, and it was Josh. Basically, uh, really, really wants to be involved with the film. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if it might be a cancellation of the deal, but he also said to sweeten the deal that he has Little Samson. Little Samson is the side-scrolling platformer reminiscent of the Mega Man series, but like Jetsons, published by Tato late in the NES run. As Jay said before, this is in his top three games to get, and one that he's been personally hunting for for years. Hi, is Josh there, please? Yes, Sam. Hey, Josh, it's Jay calling you back. How are you, man? Oh, hey, dude. What I was saying is, if you want to send me a list of the stuff you're, you know, the, maybe the more rare stuff you're looking for, because like I said, I got at least probably 500 uh, Nintendo games here. Um, the, the one you did mention on, uh, on the voice message there was Little Samson. Um, what, are you, what are you looking at for that cart? I mean, like, like that one, like if I were to throw it on eBay or something, uh, I would probably put around, you know, 650 or 7 and just wait for the right person. Little Samson, I have seen actually a couple through through my tracks. Um, I've seen one pretty high, about eight, which was way overpriced, and I've seen one as low as three hundred. So I'm looking at uh, spending about three three to four hundred bucks. Yeah, that might be. Yeah. Well, I mean, you you have to understand, man. I mean, that's that's a, not a small chunk of change I'm paying, especially with the budget I I have. So. And, you know, we obviously appreciate it and all that. Um, the little Samson, I'm going to have to think about. I'm not saying no at this point, but I'm definitely going to have to think about it. I don't really know what to think about it, to be honest, Rob. It's, he wants to be involved. He wants us to come to Florida. We're not going to go to Florida, right? I mean, it's just not in the roots, not in the budget. So at the end of the day, I mean, there's no legal contract. There's no eBay contract or anything, obviously. So if he pulls out, he pulls out. I can't do anything about that, so. The next few days went by fast, but that doesn't mean it was uneventful. First, we hit Cincinnati. So for the last few days of this leg of the journey, I'm really putting on the brakes. What's going on, man? Hey, how you are you? Man? Yeah, yeah, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing all right. Ooh, yeah, Donkey Kong 3. It's the first time I think we've seen that. There's that Tom Sawyer again. We should probably maybe get that, what do you think? 
Kiwi craze, I think that's a rare one. I'm gonna quickly just look these up. Maybe the Dragon Warrior, and I'm pretty much done here. So. Despite his plans to slow down, Jay snagged well over 30 games at the game swap stores we encountered in Ohio. But they were all fairly uncommon titles, so that was cause to celebrate, NES club style, at an arcade. But the late night fun didn't erase the early morning trip to Indianapolis. Uh, I'm not seeing much. This might be the first time we've actually not purchased anything. Up until now, I've picked up at least something from each store. But I think I have all these. It's the last stop on the first road trip, the Gibraltar Trade Center. This is a huge stop for Jay because when he gets back home, he will lose several days to hunt due to an increased work schedule. So he's got to make the most of this last opportunity. Yeah, there's a couple of, uh, there's actually about four or five bins here. So yeah. take a couple of minutes to go through. I'm guessing these are the uncommon ones. So Dusty Diamond, that's one of the 20. So that's good. Don't worry about that. Works fine, we tested it. Actually, all the stuff I got in here is uncommon, so I'm really glad we spent the last day and uh, went to Detroit. It's gonna be a lot of uh, organizing the collection. I just wanna make sure everything's accounted for. I definitely wanna start cleaning a lot of them, because ugh, germaphobe. To help understand and maybe appreciate what Jay's going through on his quest, I thought it would be great to speak to some other collectors in the Nintendo community and get their take on the collecting process and how they approach finding the items they want with the money they have. The first thing I need to identify when I go through the door is where is the, the classic gaming section? Where do you have your Intellivision games, your Atari 2600 games, your NES games? It's hard when you actually find the item because then if it's not up to your standards, it's a little disappointing. Someone comes in here and says to me, hey, I have a rare title uh, first thing that you know the hairs on the back of my neck stand up i'm like all right let's go see this thing of course you know you got the stadium events and all those ones that are just you know forget it so it's out of the question if the price point is right it's it's mine i'm taking it with me it's it's coming home with me that day if something big that i've been looking for forever is sitting right in front of me and even if it's like twenty dollars over the price it should be if it's you know the correct item it's in perfect condition you know, go ahead and do it. If I saw a stadium event, I wouldn't be one that could, could even think about buying it, even if there was a line of people waiting for it and I had it in my hands. It's just too expensive. I, I just, I couldn't live with my, I, myself or my, my wife would probably kick me out of the house. Depending on the funds, right now I'm on top of the world. Talk to me a year ago, yeah, price meant everything because I didn't have any money. Collecting takes a long time to, uh, to get to the point where you want to, you know, have your collection exactly where you want it to be. What's that? Get it all in your mouth. There you go. Well, I've learned you never know really what to expect. There's been so many times we've thought this was gonna go one way and it goes the other way. Or, oh, that will never happen and it happens. Um, definitely my negotiating skills, which I had zero of before. I've never done that. I hope at least I've got better in that. I think I have. I like to know the story for each cart, like what, what happened to this poor thing, why it's in this condition. Like it's like someone set a sandwich on it and kind of, like I can't even get that off. I don't even know if it's blood. I don't even want to touch it. Ew. Any thoughts to flying anywhere? Uh, no, not really. Why's that? Just have no interest in doing that. Why? Uh, just suffering from anxiety as I do. I mean, I'm, I've started to have, over the last few years, anxiety being in cars for some reason, being, uh, it's really weird being in like the middle of an intersection at a stop sign. I don't know if it's I feel claustrophobic, but it's almost a feeling of like wanting to pass out. I don't know, it's, it's strange. And I'm afraid, to be quite honest, that that in itself is getting out of control. I can't imagine being in a tube in the air that high. I don't know, man. There's one other subject that gives Jay anxiety attacks. And as best friends for over 30 years, we've only talked about it once. My dad was, it was a different story. We didn't uh, get along at all, ever. His dad was his dad, but um, 
Bob never understood, and he wouldn't sit down and try and play a game or anything like that, which was too bad. He uh, wanted me to be something that I wasn't, and when I showed him who I was, you know, I was I loved music, I loved video games, I loved Star Wars. He didn't want anything to do with that, and he made it quite clear. I remember getting up, and he was walking back and forth. Um, upstairs. He's just like, I don't feel good. I don't feel good. I don't feel good. And, you know, my dad always had 101 excuses why he didn't want to work, right? There's always something why he couldn't work, always in and out of jobs. And so I, I get up and, you know, say a few choice words like, you know, you're just faking it or whatever. And I remember going back to sleep and then I heard like, Bam. Downstairs. Just like, it was probably the loudest noise I've ever heard in my life. And then my mom just screaming. And so the rest of that is like a, like a slow motion kind of uh, experience. So I rushed down. He's laying there on the floor. We didn't know what to do. I don't know what to do. So it was... Uh, January is freezing cold. I ran outside on my bare feet. I ran, uh, our neighbor was a nurse. I went and got her. Uh, I went and got Norm. I don't know why I got Norm, but I did. And so we rushed back. And uh, Norm tried to revive him, and that was it. He just wasn't coming back. He was gone. And I just had such a relief, man, that it was over, you know? that I, we were free, that my mom and I were free. Because he was a, he was a tyrant, he was awful. He's the worst person I've ever met in my life. It was hard because he lost his Nan, who he loved dearly, and then Pop, and then his dad. So he doesn't handle that well. Like, God forbid I should ever get really sick. I don't know what he'd do. No, I've had a bad day today. <laughs> Why is that? Ah, uh, stuff with work and personal stuff. Uh huh. Um, negoti negotiations of stadium events have taken a bit of a turn. I'm not too excited about it. What's happened? Get the guy's number. Ah, uh, now basically I'm supposed to send the money. Um, supposed to send the money without uh, having received the game. If I give it to Todd with no money up front and something happens, I'm out the game and the money. So what about me, question mark? Again, another reason that you guys should come here, it's the most important part of the film and the most important game in the film, and you're not even going to be here to get it. Either way, I don't know you, plus you live in another country, so if you guys tamper with it and something goes wrong, what am I going to do with a damaged game? And I write, Josh, we've already found one fake on our journey so far, and I'm not accusing you of that by any means. If you send the game with Todd and it checks out, he will bring you the money as planned. That's the only way this will work. If you don't trust it, I understand. Todd is your friend. He's not going to let anything happen to it. Trust me, man. I want this game. What's, what's going on? We, we sent a bunch of messages back and forth today, and we're uh, kind of at a standstill here. So what are you thinking? Um, yeah, well, the thing I'm worried about is, uh, uh, like, on my side, what I was saying is, I mean, I know it's real, you know, because, I mean, the link that I sent you on the eBay link, I mean, you could see the whole, the board and everything on there, all the numbers. I mean, I do understand your point, man. I, I do, but I can't send $4,000 to, to someone I don't know, and it's obviously, like I said to you in the Facebook message, it's not a you know, it's not personal, and I'm not calling you a, a bootleg or anything like that. Just this is the most expensive game I've ever bought. I, I just want you to see the game and tell me that everything looks right. I, I know, Josh, and dude, I believe me, man. If I, I'm a gamer and you're a gamer, and it, it's it's not personal, man. But we're talking four thousand and 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 JPEGs on the internet. You know, I can't I can't just go on that, man. And there's no 
legal binding document. There's no eBay or you know anything, Amazon or anything like that. This is coming from guy to guy kind of thing. I mean, well, I, yeah, I mean, I bought you know three and only got one one real one in my hands, you know. So like, uh, I mean, yeah, this game is probably giving me. <laughs> so you you've had a few you've had a few fakes then. Well, brother, you just said it, man. Then you know exactly how I feel. I think it's kind of, we've kind of both made up our minds here, man. We should probably just put it to rest, I think, and uh, just just move on from there. I mean, yeah. <laughs> That's what you want to do, man. I mean, I was going to say, you know, yeah. just, you know, talking to you again about it or whatever, I mean, you know. Um, yeah, well, hours, yeah, yeah, I don't know. We'll we'll see we'll see where it goes. I mean, if if things drastically change, um, send me a message. I'll think about it. But as of right now, we'll just we'll call it off, man. Okay, I, I agree, man. Okay, dude, it's right, it's it's been a pleasure, man. Honestly, um, I wish you well. All right, man. Okay, take care. Right. Every single game is gonna have a story to it. Um, this is the game I want the most. And it's not the story I want for it. One of the ways the NES legacy continues to live on today is through competitive gaming. Regional, national, and global competitions still use titles from the NES library to draw in world-class gamers who vie for that top spot. To hear their thoughts, we talked to John Pompa and Mason Kramer, a pair of competitive gamers, to hear the difference on playing for fun and going for that top spot, the kind of attributes you need to go pro, and of course to talk to them about the biggest competitive gaming championship in history. For me, and a majority of the ones that I talk to or, you know, play with, they're more challenging. John Papa holds over 20 world records with more than a handful on titles from the NES library. You can put everything you have into these new games. You know, the new Batman game, it'll look amazing, it, it, you know, but it's done in a half hour, an hour, you know, you got, you, you beat the game and there's really no replay value. In 2008, the Guinness Book of World Records published their first Gamers Edition and has since published the volume annually in January, thus giving the gaming community and competitive gamers somewhere to get their name and scores in print. I, when, when I found out I was in the Guinness Book, I called everybody I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I called my mom and I said, Mom, I did it. I called my sister and I called all my friends and I was really pumped, man. Mason Kramer also holds some legendary records, most notably high score with one life on Super Mario Bros. 3, arguably the most popular NES title of all time. You can get good at a certain type of game, but it, the real test of a master is their ability to learn and to adapt to new play styles and new techniques. I think that NWC represents a sort of high water mark in competitive gaming. The most people that have ever been at a contest, the most competitors who have ever entered, everyone wanted a slice of NWC. The Nintendo World Championship, sometimes referred to as NWC, represents a fever pitch of the NES era. It was every kid's dream to be a part of this glitzy Hollywood production that brought players from all over the country together to win cash and prizes all just for playing Nintendo games. Getting in the Guinness Book of World Records pales in comparison to beating out a million other people at NWC the way Thor did. Now the NWC was something conceived and executed in an epic scale. Even pictures can't do it justice, it was just so cool. This followed the release of The Wizard, so there was already kind of a buildup in the this Nintendo culture out there where everybody was like, hey, I want to be a part of that. The numbers that I got were there were 1.1 million entrants for the contest. And there has never been anything remotely similar to the scale ever attempted again. Because it shouldn't be 23 years later that there's still nothing like it. 
It's day 19 and Jay's headed back to ANC Games in Toronto. Last time he was here, he focused on the rare games. This time, he knows he can't leave any game behind. And since time is of the essence, Jay's employed the film's producer, Mike Frusios, to help him track the day's acquisitions. So far that was the most intense negotiation and that's the most money I've spent in one spot. Uh, it was a good almost hour negotiations. Uh, all these games I got here are just crazy. Well, I'm gonna log in the, the 20 extra we got from the basement. We'll, we'll do a count and see where we're at there. The tally, ladies and gentlemen, is 554. Bubble Bobble 2 has been replaced. Stock up is now the most rare. But already behind a few days to hunt since the last road trip, we had to keep pushing. So we hit one more spot that, to our surprise, offered a very uncommon kind of treasure. Near mint condition NES game boxes. This was very expensive. Um, but when are you ever going to see stuff like this? It's kind of those things I wrestle with where it's like once in a, that's, that's a once in a lifetime thing. For some, it's hard to understand why Jay would risk any of his budget just on the boxes, especially when he doesn't necessarily even have the games to accompany them. The answer is simple though, the boxes are pieces of art. Like the games, condition is critical and it's the design that makes them memorable and sought after. Someone who has an understanding of box art is illustrator Mark Erickson. Mark's responsible for the artwork on games like Tengen's Tetris, Gorilla War, Bad Dudes, Strider, and infamously, Mega Man 2. They would play a beta version of the game for me. And, uh, the, and I meant physically they would play it because I'm not a gamer, I'm just an illustrator. And over a period of about 30 or 40 minutes, we would just arrive at, at what they wanted me to do. Uh, the famous Mega Man 2 incident was about the, the only thing sticks in my mind where they just led me in the wrong direction and had me do a piece of art that wasn't correct. Amazingly, the people that hired me to do the art and the art director, neither one of them knew the game, and we ran the beta version, as I described to you, and nobody could see the little character well enough to, dis to, to, to know he had a cannon for an arm, and long story short, you know, they told me to put a pistol in there, and that's what I did. To have the gaming stuff, for me, is huge, because I realize there's this base of fans who love this art, and it's, I, uh, it's just to say it's very gratifying to me is an understatement. As we march towards the inevitable future of digital-only games, the entire notion of boxes, carts, or manuals are disappearing, along with any real sense of their history. These are cool items that document historical information. You don't have to worry about uploading your updates and whatever else. You just you plug it in, maybe the screen blinks. But you have to blow in the cartridge or whatever, but it's just, there's something that's, you know, it's just, it's more charming about it. But when you actually physically look at a cartridge and you can see the picture of the game, you know which game it is, you can trade it with your friends or something, it's so much different than when it's invisible. Why do kids nowadays want to play uh, on the original console and have a piece of this? Multiple reasons, because they weren't there, because they want to understand where it came from. If someone were to show me a library of NES games in a file on their computer, I'm not impressed. If someone were to show me the artifacts, that's what matters. Anyone can take a picture. Anyone can have a, have a digital file of it. But the games physically are an artifact, something to be preserved, put in a plastic case. Day 21 means it's time for the second road trip. This time, we drive 12 hours the first day to end up in St. Louis. From there, we hit Dallas, Austin, Houston, and then on the way back home, we meet up with a pair of private collectors in Oklahoma City and Bedford, Indiana, respectively. Believe me when I say this trip features a lot of driving, and like Jay predicted, there was a lot of running in and out of stores to see if they had the few select titles that he still needed. Here are some of the highlights in the first few days of the trip. We got, uh, I don't know. Maybe about uh, 10 more games, and we met uh, Jason, who's the owner of the store. He showed us his personal collection, which was the best collection I've ever seen. He's cool too, he's like, you know, I buy the game, 
to have it, and then I do the upgrades, you know, and if I see one with a better label or a better box, I upgrade that as well. We were on the road all of day 22, but day 23 saw us in Dallas, where we met up with video game media personality Patrick Scott Patterson, who's the kind of guy with his pulse on the world of gaming, and he brought with him a mysterious bag of games. Reach into the bag. There's a game show now. And pull right. out. Is there not a scorpion in here? No, it? there's not a scorpion okay. or a snake. Let's see what happens here. All right. So the first one we got is Strider. So Strider I have. Okay. Strider I do have. Okay. Come on, no whammies. Three Stooges, which I do have. Oh, man. I do have. Oh, we look at that. Nope, don't have that one. <laughs> I feel like I just got kicked. <laughs> and I pulled out Panic Restaurant by Tato, which I didn't have, so man, I almost fell over when I pulled that one out. So, what was that place like? Expensive. Yeah, I didn't like that. So yeah, 50 bucks for Donkey Kong and Might and Magic. I'm not too happy with that. Why Well, because they're there at this point. Um, I don't know how many more of these I want to hit, to be completely honest. I can't afford to be doing 50 bucks for two games now at this point. And I mean, like, like I said before we started this whole thing, like that's not a rare game, but it's expensive. So I don't know. I don't feel too good about this one. If we didn't have those two collectors in the works, that would be a different story. I think maybe we should call those guys and see what's up. See what they have, see what kind of deals we can get. That's what I want to do. I don't know, I just, I felt like I was sick giving the cash out. Like I felt really ill. It's kind of funny how Jay mentions he's starting to feel sick about making purchases. And then moments later, pulls me aside and he has to be back home a day earlier for work. I'm not sure if it was a miscommunication issue or not, but I'm sure the two are related. And now I've got to reconfigure the rest of the trip in my head as we're about to pick up Todd Rogers from the airport. Uh, what's up? Can I get your autograph? Uh, all right, nice he, and he, he's the man. I mean, you know, Mr. Nintendo. I'm excited. Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> Todd Rogers is the world's first pro gamer. He was paid by several companies to play games because of his incredible skills at deconstructing and mastering them. He was also an employee of Nintendo and holds thousands of gaming records. Why don't you show me some of the games you have the world record on? Well, I have it on Zexon, Yars Revenge, Star Master, Star Voyager, Skiing. I guess games on every one of these roads. Cubert, Pitfall, Laser Blast, Kangaroo, E.T., Chopper Command. That and of course the favorite, <laughs> Dragster up in the corner. When Nintendo came out, man, they had, I mean, the graphics were incredible. The gameplay was great. The controller was easy to hold. I mean, you know, they had, they put a lot of thought and effort into listening to what the public wanted. Working for Nintendo was really, really cool because there were a lot of open-minded people that worked for that company. They wanted to bring the entertainment to the home. They wanted you, the consumer, to play as a collective or as a group rather than just single to. With Todd part of the team for the day and Jay's honorary mentor, we traveled south, a stone's throw away from the Gulf of Mexico, to check out a brand new Game Over video game store. Hello. Oh, the air's on. I'll get some there, and they got this rack over here. So okay. Yeah, there's a few here. Which ones? Cool World, uh, Gargoyle's Quest. So that one I need is 89. That one I need is 49. So from 50. <laughs> Just like that? Yeah, I mean, take 50 Just bucks. like that. Yeah, I mean, what's worse they can do? Say no. Okay, we got a huge wall here. Okay, so it's the last store. Uh, found a couple of real rare ones. Just go through it real quick. Uh, Gargoyle's Quest by Capcom. Toxic Crusader, cool world, but the big one we got was the Turtles Tournament Fighter. Oh, I wish we could do this every day. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's a blast. I mean, it definitely beats the, the hub, the roll of everyday boredom. I mean, this is really cool. But just because Jay was done hunting games for the day doesn't mean we were done hanging out with Todd. That night, we had a blast at dinner. Todd called Twin Galaxies founder Walter Day, who then allowed Todd to unveil and present us with our own Twin Galaxies video game trading card. 
and of course, we got to play some games. I can only speculate for Jay, but our time with the legendary Todd Rogers was unforgettable. Uh, we're going to a collector's house who reached out to us, uh, who has about 500 NES games. Um, the only thing is he doesn't know there's a film crew, so we'll see how that goes. Um, hopefully he's got some of those titles. Uh, I was sitting at 6.05, so we're doing 73. well. 73 to go, and this guy's got 500 he's, games. Yeah, he said he had about 500, so I mean, that's pretty good odds that he's going to have some I need. Hopefully some of the big ones, and we get a good deal. I'm ready. Which one do you want to knock off the list today? Little Samson. It's always going to be Little Samson. What are top three? Stadium events, Little Samson, Bonk's Adventure. Nice and cool. What we're looking at over here, regular Nintendo stuff, mm -hmm. Super Nintendo 64, all organized on the table behind us here. So this is everything that I've got over $10, Nintendo Super 64. So what's for sale here? What are we looking at? Uh, pretty much everything. What's this one? What's that going for? I probably wouldn't sell any of the reproduction stuff. How much are your Zeldas, the, the classic ones? Those probably aren't for sale. So dare I ask? I've never, I've never given anybody a price on it. That's interesting. Don't have that one yet. Yeah. The power pad. So this is for use with stadium events amongst other games. Got that for dirt cheap. Uh, and I got Color Dinosaur, which is a really rare one. So score there. Uh, there's about 70 left I have to get. So um, what I'm starting to think now is some of the games that I thought were, I was gonna find everywhere are some of the harder ones to get, like Bases Loaded 4 and that's that Corvette one. I've never seen them. So, I don't know, I'm getting pretty nervous with one stop left. Let's hope this goes through. If not, we still have a few days back home. So this is almost, almost my last hope here. So I'm hoping to clear out this guy, get all the big rare ones, all the commons I need, and that'll be it. Todd Curtis is a collector who reached out to us very early on about helping Jay's insane endeavor. My NES collection encompasses all the North American released games, both licensed and unlicensed. The prized pieces in my collection at this time are the Nintendo World Championship cartridges, the stadium events that's complete in the box. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to be disappointed. Um, a little bit like yesterday, I'm afraid like, oh, I have everything and then I'm going to go in there and he's going to have everything, but oh, not for sale, not for sale, not for sale. So. I don't want to get my hopes up, so it's kind of a mixture of emotions right now. So I hear you're going to show me around your collection, and you might have uh, some stuff for sale here. We have a collection to do here. Come on in. Whoa. <laughs> You got a few things, eh? It's kind of the, the rare stuff is in this display case. Yep. You have two Nintendo World Championships. That's right. right. That's pretty greedy, don't you think? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, so we have, I see four stadium events here. Well, so one's two, sealed, right? Well, one's complete in the box. Okay. It's out of the box. So really okay. there's only two. So these are all the carts, kind of separate from their boxes. Right. On this side, we have all the boxes, the inserts, everything to go along with that, the manuals. Wow. That makes sense. Okay, so I'm not gonna pull anything out. I'm just gonna look through it right now. Is he okay to pull stuff out that he needs? I don't know if I wanna do that just yet. I'm gonna look at it first, okay? okay and then we'll see uh, where we go from there. Uh, I just want to talk to you for a few minutes off camera. 
before we go any further here. Okay, so give us a sec here. I was hoping for one of the big ones. At this point, I would almost rather just take the money I have and just get those instead of getting these lesser known titles for the sake of 70, being, 70 games being the difference. Like there's no Samson, there's no Bonk, there's no stadium events. Todd, do you have any other titles with a chance? I mean, anything in particular. <laughs> uh, really, stadium events, little Samson or Bonks is really what I'm interested in. At this point, okay. because the difference of games I need to complete is so small, uh -huh. for me personally, I'd rather get one of the big ones instead of getting a lot of the smaller ones, mm -hmm. that's just me. Okay. Right or wrong, that's how I want to do things, so. Well, you know, the little Samson was one of the last ones I bought in a box like that. Mm -hmm. So I know there's one in that box. So if there's one on the shelf. Like that? Yeah. Holy shit. Uh, you say Bonk's Adventure? That one's in the box. Got it. Just a reminder, Little Samson is number two in terms of rarity and price on the NES list for the retail games. Jay's only other offer was through Josh Jones, a deal that fell apart. Bonk's Adventure is number three in terms of rarity and price for Jay. And dare I ask you about the other one? Which other one? The stadium events. Unbelievably, Todd has two copies of stadium events. One complete with its original box and manual, and one with just its box, though there's a slight tear on the back. The price for stadium events is usually astronomical on its own, but when you throw in the box or the box and manual, you're talking some serious cash. I mean, I'm going to sell more than likely one of the two, mm -hmm. but it would have to go with its box. I can't break it from its box. Okay, so that's a totally different beast on its own. Okay, so these two are for sale. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm gonna go over here. Do you wanna hang on to these for now? Put them wherever you want. Okay, I'll put them over here. So Jane went back to the bins and was able to pull out 30 games or so. Some rare, some common, but all titles he needed. Jay and Todd were able to work out a deal for those games, as well as Little Samson and Box Adventure. So sure enough, he pulls out Bonk, Heart Attack 1, and I'm like shaking, holding the cart. And then he had a little Samson, and that was unbelievable. And like the deals keep getting better, but he gave those two cards for me at such a reasonable price, I almost felt bad. And then I picked up about 30 others. The stack of everything total was way less than what I was expecting to spend. I'm, I'm just, I don't know. That guy was awesome. It's day 28 and we're all happy to be back in Canada after another long drive and to be out of the van. Except for one of us who is uh, racing to the vet with a little bit of an emergency. Jay is taking his dog Spencer in to see if he's all right. He's not been doing well, throwing up and really acting out of character. So it's a bit of a cause for concern. I hope for Jay's sake that everything works out. Don't know how it's gonna affect the rest of the, the challenge, of course. All we can do is see what's going on, get some more information and try to regroup and finish strong. Let the record show. See if I can get this all loaded up here. 514, day one. So day 30, he has until 514. I'm getting a text message from Schemes. 514 on day 30. So he's gonna have that whole last day up until 514 p.m. All right, this is it. Day 30, the very last day. And I'm gonna check out the three local shops that I frequent, and that's all I can do, man. So hopefully there's good stuff in there. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, how you doing? Back again, one last time. Yeah, here you go. Okay, here we go. Barnstorming. 
Oh, we're back again. <laughs> What's up, man? What's that? The third. This is the final stop for the whole film. All right. Well, I'm hoping we can get a few into this place. Nigel Manson's World Championship. Damn it. Sports games really confuse me. I think we got Bigfoot. Let's hope we didn't get Bigfoot. <sighs> so I'm just reaching here now. So how close are you guys to uh, completing the goal? Uh, not good, my friend. Not good. I don't know, buddy. It's not looking too good. You always got to look. You always got to look. Got them all. Everything except last Starfighter. Score. Classic concentration. Uh, fourth one down? Yeah. One. You guys got anything rare in for NES or anything in the back? No, we just got a whole bunch of Nintendo games in over the last one. Oh, I like to hear that. Are they all put out? Uh, yep. Yeah. They are? Okay. Okay. I didn't really realize what I was in for. I mean, I knew it was going to be difficult, but it was grueling. Kind of disappointed. It didn't really play out like I, I wanted it to. If I did get stadium events, everyone would be like, well, he didn't do it, but holy cow, he got this one. He got the best one. It's weird, man, that something like this can, can change you. Um, but it but it really has. Yeah, I'm gonna miss it. that same fear you know I don't know if you guys have this but when when you're opening presents and people watch you open presents do you get that I hate that was someone who I think let things get to me. I let things get me down too easily. Very negative. Saw things in a darker light, if you will. So I look at things in a more positive, positive way now. I'm, I'm a lot happier. I just feel, I don't know, I feel fulfilled. This is all the carts that I've collected for the entire journey. Uh, and this little stack here actually represents the ones that I was short. So these are the ones I did not collect. Um, I knew you were coming back six to eight months later, um, so I acquired them on eBay, which, believe me, was not nearly as fun. These here was so impersonal, there was no communication with anybody, it was just buy it now, bid, buy it now, bid, and then, you know, two weeks later, it's shipped to my door, and all of a sudden, I have gut knack. It's not nearly as rewarding, right, so... These aren't all the games, there's one, there's still one game missing, and it's the game that means the most to me. And I want this game to have a story. So we're hitting the road. Oh, 
Hello, my friend. Hey. How are you, man? How are you? Good. Good to see you. It's good to see you, too. Yeah. This is last of the games, right? 678. This is it. Yeah. This is last one. Huh? Let's go in. As you can see, here's the good stuff. And I understand that this is what you're looking for. It's been, uh, it's been long, man. This is uh, pretty emotional, so. Huh? Take him and look at him. See what you think. I'm shaking. You know, it was a surprise to me not only to have one box stadium events, but to have two. And the second I had two, I started looking for a home for the first. Yeah. And I had no idea when that would be, and it turned out it happened pretty quickly. And I think that the right person's getting it. Because uh, I know that you'll, you'll enjoy it, you'll care for it, but on a long quest, this is a great finale to that quest. I don't even know what to say, dude. Like, thank you. Thank <laughs> you, welcome. Glad I could uh, help you out. Oh my God, I think I'll pass out. Seriously. I was a little surprised how nerve-wracked he seemed to be. <laughs> you know, and and I don't know if it was because he thought maybe he would actually get down here and I would look at it and say, no, never mind, I can't do this. And then you know, a whole trip all the way down here is is for nothing. So I've been uh, I've been hearing that the boxes are pretty pretty rare as well. The box is the hard, hardest thing to find. Yeah. Is there a number on that, do you know? Like, how many there is, or? It's under 10. Is you know, it? I, I, I can account for maybe six. But then to see him with it actually in his hands, you know, he was shaking a little bit, holding something I think that maybe he thought he would never hold, or, you know, and, and to know that that was going to be his own. I thought that was really exciting. You know, it was exciting for me. He understands why uh, stadium events is important and what it would mean to his collection. So I was just glad to, uh, in all honesty, to see him finish his journey. So I failed the 30-day challenge, but I don't know. I guess that didn't matter after a while because I, I wanted to complete the collection this way. You have to want it bad enough to give up a lot in your life. And that sounds <clears throat> ridiculous because we're talking about Nintendo games. But really, if you want it bad enough, you'll, you'll get it. After saving every penny for the last eight months and making the most expensive purchase of his life, Jay's quest has finally come to an end. This is something I think about a lot, okay? It's a, a Dave Grohl story. But when he talks about becoming a musician, he talks about his mom, who was a music teacher, his dad was a politician, and he knew right away he wanted to play music. So he was like 13, 14 years old, 15, I think. And he went to his mom and he said, Mom, I'm gonna, you know, jump in a van with these guys and we're gonna tour around, I'm gonna play music, and I'm not gonna go to school anymore because this is what I have to do. You know what she said? Go for it. And I just wonder, I mean, why all parents aren't like that? I mean, if he had fallen on his face, they would still be there to pick him up because that's their responsibility. But for them to even say, go for it, yeah, leave school. And he always jokes about it. It's like, this is what happens when you drop out of school. And I love that line. It's hilarious because it's like, there's so many rules that everyone brings you up thinking that that's the way things are. No matter what happens in this world, you can never deny what you feel inside. You can never doubt yourself because those are true feelings and nobody can take that away from you. People can tell you you're wrong, but you know deep down inside what's right. 
you love you love what you love and that's just the way it is and you have to go with that and one of the things Jay loves most is video games. He journeyed far beyond the comfort of his home in London, Ontario in pursuit of his number one passion and in the process made history. And while he now has a complete collection of retail NES games, the challenge became so much more than that. He got to meet dozens of other people that share his passion and help Jay grow as a person. When everyone said he was crazy to do it, he went out and did it anyway. And like owning the only box copy of stadium events in Canada, no one can take that away from him. I dare Jay, and now I'm daring you. Chase your dreams and do the impossible. Go on the quest of a lifetime because the adventures that await you are priceless. Who doesn't, man? Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA start. Up, up, down, 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 left, right, left, right, BA select start. I, I did the two player version. The up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA select start. Up, up, down, down, left, right, BA. I have a buddy who always punches that in for me. Left, left, down, right, right, down. No, I don't know that card. <laughs> Nintendo gave us uh, the sort of like uh, lithographs of um, basically early um, sketches of Mario by Shigeru Miyamoto. So these are some of the early sketches he would have done uh, for Donkey Kong. The NES saved the video game industry after it collapsed in 82, 83. So if not for Nintendo, there wouldn't be anything here. They were the first console to deliver what I think is something close to the arcade experience in your home. So 1985 is a good year to launch a system, a console system, that begins to improve the graphics. Four or five years old, and my dad got me a Nintendo Entertainment System. And right after I blow out the candles, right after the cake, right away, let's go hook it up. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money back then, and uh, got uh, my NES action set for Christmas. We only had one game. Uh, throughout my childhood, I only had one game. It was the game that I came with, Mario Duck Hunt. Still to this day, it's my favorite game. First things come to mind is just hanging out with my brother, playing Super Mario Brothers 3 in the basement. Like, handing it back and forth every every death or every level, depending on what you did. You know, I was gonna run out, I was gonna beg my parents, and I was gonna get it. You know, and to this day, I've never been let down by Nintendo Power. When I found out that my parents were hiding one in the garage, you know, just knowing it was in the garage in a box, and you wanna play it, but you have to wait till Christmas, that, that's the memory I have about the, the NES. The NES has withstood the test of time, and as soon as this interview is over, I'll be picking up a console without a doubt. You can guarantee it. The NES library is way beyond any library for any machine I've ever seen. There's just no competition. I think it's their commitment to quality. I think they really, they won't put out a game unless they really feel like it's, it's connecting with the gamers. When I got home from school and did my homework, there was a two to three hour point in the day where I could escape and I, I could be in control of the world. I could be the hero, I, and the goals were achievable, I had control. Right, well, the first day I had my NES, I was sitting there in my bathrobe, my dad was in his bathrobe, which, you know, we actually have a photograph, and I'm sitting on the end of my bed and my dad's sitting there shooting at Hogan's Alley. And it just kind of blew my mind that that was probably the first game my dad ever played in his whole entire life, and he was doing it on Christmas Day with me. 
and I'll never forget it. And those are the things that you know, those are the things that bring back, and it's like a story. It, it has really sometimes it has nothing to do with the games. You know, it's the story behind the games. I remember going to Sears when the NES came out and filling out an application for a credit card so I could get the $25 gift card and go buy the NES. I had to have it. 13 years ago, I was 210 pounds, plus size 1820, and I was walking past an arcade and I discovered Dance Dance Revolution and I decided to play it. I instantly died within 10 steps and uh, some kid chuckled from the side. <laughs> You suck, and it hurt my feelings. And um, I remember I went home that day because I really had an instant connection with the game. And when I went home, uh, I, I was upset. I looked at all my previous awards that I had uh, from playing sports in the past, and I looked at my old pictures. And I didn't recognize the reflection I saw in the mirror anymore. This person who was now 210 pounds, that used to be 120. And I made a commitment that moment that I was going to master the game. How could I not be envious of Jay's 30-day adventure to find 700 old games? And plus, everybody seems to have a little bit of ar archaeologist in them, you know, some that are going and being the Indiana, Indiana Jay, Indiana Jay on the road to finding all those, all those lost, forgotten, hidden, mystical games that who knows where they're going to show up.